Lance Berkman, welcome back to Sports Spectrum, buddy. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing good. Just uh, enjoying the spring weather down here. It's been really great. So uh, baseball season, can't complain. No, you can't. And I should have called you Coach Berkman, which is the new sort of moniker that you go by. You're not just a former baseball player anymore. You're a coach coaching at Houston Baptist. Uh, did you really think at some point, or maybe when did you think at, at which point did you think you'd be going from the former baseball player to being called coach and this would be the road that God was going to take you on? Well, towards the end of my career, um, one of the things that I really enjoyed was working with the younger players. Uh, seemed like I kind of fell into more of a mentor role and, and I really enjoyed sharing my playing experience and life experience with some of the younger guys to try to help them get acclimated to the big leagues. And um, so I knew that I kind of enjoyed that aspect of baseball just being able to share the things that I've learned and and so uh, as I got closer to retirement in the back of my mind and I can't really pinpoint exactly when but I always felt that the college level would be um, a, a great place to coach and I, I part of that is driven by my college experience and it's the most fun that I ever had playing um, high school, college, major leagues, minor leagues. I mean, the most fun I ever had playing baseball in my life was when I was at Rice. And so uh, I just love the age, you know, kids are, they're mature enough to, you know, take the, take the game seriously. They're at a time in their lives when they're transitioning from being in their parents' house to being out on their own. And, and so it's really appealing to me to, to be the authority figure that kind of stands in that gap and helps guys go from boyhood to manhood and, um, you know, hopefully, you know, we send our guys out well prepared to meet the challenges of life, not just of, of baseball. What's the tough, besides wins and losses, obviously, what's the toughest challenge for you as a coach? Well, there's a couple. I would say the on field challenge is, um, is kind of is talent identification. You know, it's not the game. I've, I've seen thousands of baseball games in my life, and you kind of have a, a good understanding because of that of how the sport works and and you know the things that are important to emphasize in practice and uh but the biggest challenge in college is the recruiting and, and a big part of the recruiting is you you, you go out there and you're watching a, a 16 year old 17 year old kid play baseball and you're trying to project and think man you know is this what's this guy going to look like when he's 20 21 um is he going to be the kind of guy that that we want to have in our program, those kinds of things. That's a real, a real challenge. And I've enjoyed part, the recruiting part of it is fun when you can get a kid on campus and you can kind of sell your vision for the program and you can talk to his parents and you get a good feel for the kind of person that he is and that uh, the background that he comes from. So I've enjoyed that part of it, but the biggest challenge is, is the talent identification and trying to figure out who are the right guys to get on the campus. And, and um, so we're, Fortunately, I have a, a good staff that helps me in that area, and, and it's where your your past connections can really help you. Um, I know a lot of the guys that are involved in amateur baseball around the city of Houston, so that helps get us in the door, uh, and gives us an inside track and some some information on guys that maybe others wouldn't get. So uh, we're we're figuring that piece out, um, and that's kind of the the um, the challenge that I face off the field. And then, you know, from a coaching standpoint, when you're playing, you are responsible for one person and that's you. I mean, you got to get yourself ready to play. You know what your job is, you know what you're expected to do and your role on the team. And when you coach, you've got 40 guys that you're trying to manage and you're worried about each one of those guys and what they're supposed to do and making sure that they do it. And, and so those are the type of things that I think are, are different about coaching than, you know, than playing. Why was this the right time to say yes to God for this opportunity? Uh, you know, I, I just feel like that I'd been praying and it's an interesting story about how the HBU deal even came up and I, you know, without making it a real long winded story. Um, of course we, we live here in Houston. I've still got three daughters I have four daughters overall but three that are still in the house and so um, I didn't really want to pick up and move to chase an opportunity so in the city of Houston you basically have there's four division one programs but three that 
uh, I felt were realistic for me, Rice, U of H, and, and HBU. And I tried to get the Rice job, but it, it came open not too long ago and had really worked hard to try to land that opportunity and it didn't work out. So it was kind of a closed door there. And I'd kind of almost not given up, but just felt like, well, maybe this is not the right timing. And and so uh, I got a phone call out of the blue from a, a guy that had um, recruited some of my players in high school uh, when I was a high school coach at, at Second Baptist. And he, his name's Clay Vanderlin, and he was the head coach at the University of St. Thomas, which is a division three school uh, here in Houston. And he was trying to pick my brain about some hitting things. He had had a hitting coach and they had uh, lost their hitting coach. And so he was a former pitcher and wanted to know my thoughts on hitting. And so I told him I'd be happy to visit with him and went down. And by, by the end of the conversation, he offered me the job as their hitting instructor. He said, Hey, you wouldn't have, you know, I can't really pay you, but you know, would you be interested in helping us out? And I was like, well, sure. I mean, maybe this is the right, the right time for this opportunity. So I, that's what I did uh, for the 2021 season. And that kind of got me back into thinking, well, you know, this, this could be the, the gig. And so um, simultaneous to that, things sort of started falling into place with, uh, with HBU. I had a, a friend that um, knew the athletic director and I was talking to him and just made, I made kind of a random comment, you know, if, you, if, if HBU ever came available, I would certainly be interested in it. And so he said, well, you know, I think they may be looking to make a change. So he put me in contact with the athletics director here and I had a conversation with him, kind of a, just a preliminary, Hey, I'm interested if, if you guys are, I'm not trying to run anybody out of a job, but you know, I, I love to coach. And he said, well, you know, we'll keep you in mind kind of thing. Didn't think anything of it. So but that was in the fall of, of 21. And then next thing, you know, spring rolls around, he calls me back and says, um, you know, Hey, we're going to make a change and would you be interested? And so I said, yeah. And anyway, that's how I ended up getting here. And then I just brought Clay, the guy that had hired me at UST. I, I hired him to be my pitching coach. So I worked for him, you know, last year and he's working for me this year. And uh, uh, it's kind of funny how that, that worked out. So, I mean, that's, I know that's a little bit of a long winded story, but it, it definitely seemed like God, um, open the door, even through the relationship that I had with Clay, you know, to kind of get back into coaching. And it was almost like he said, you know, not only am I going to put you at HBU, but I am going to provide you with the coaches that, you know, that are going to help you. So uh, both Clay and, and then our recruiting coordinator at UST was a guy named Tyler Bremer, who he pitched at Baylor. He'd been up to AAA. Um, and so I brought him with me too. So now he's, he's my recruiting coordinator, plays my pitching coach, and, uh, we have a great synergy as a coaching staff we had last year at, at UST. And we just kind of brought the show over here and, and slightly different roles to, to Houston Baptist. So, uh, it was really neat to see how God opened those doors and put the people in my life that, uh, that are really helping me, you know, run this program today. Lance Berkman is our guest here on Sports Spectrum, a six-time Major League Baseball All-Star. He's now the head coach at Houston Baptist University. Houston Baptist, obviously, just the name itself, right, being a Christian school. Tell me about some of the intentional ways that you bring Christ into your daily role as a coach. Well, I think, you know, when you're a Christian, it's it's the lens through which you view everything. And it's the way you, you know, conduct your personal affairs and you know it's Christ is living in our hearts and and hopefully living through us with the one of my favorite passages of scripture talks about how we're Christ the ambassadors and so I think when you're when you're a believer um, that should just come out in, in everything you do from the way that you talk to the way that you treat people uh, to the way that your players see you interacting with um, guys that aren't on the team and, you know, in, in all situations. So I think primarily uh, it's just kind of who you are and you try to, you know, it's when Christ lives inside you, you hope that that's coming out on the outside. And, and so I think that's first and foremost, but in terms of, you know, we, we coach from that perspective, we expect um, that our players are going to, uh, to live up to a certain standard of ethical behavior. And so we're very clear about what we expect from them. Uh, we have done things in the past, like we'll have a proverb that we'll 
that we'll put out there at the beginning of the week, and we'll discuss it and explain why it's important. Uh, we have a team Bible study that uh, I'm helping guys. It's it's kind of a cool deal. We I had some players come to me and say, "Hey, we want to we want to lead the team Bible study. Will you help us?" And so, hmm. um, in the fall, particularly, I was meeting with three or four of these guys on a weekly basis and coaching them through leading the Bible study. And then I would make a guest appearance about every fourth study to kind of, you know, put a bow on some things and, and that, that kind of deal. And that was very um, gratifying for me. Um, so those are the type of things that we do to try to instill Christ in, in, uh, in our players. And, and even, you know, I've never been a guy that's, that's um, going to force feed the gospel to people. Uh, but what I try to do is I try to teach them gospel principles without them knowing that, that, you know, if they're, if they're, if they're uh, not believers yet, uh, we try to teach those principles. And then, you know, hopefully the light bulb comes on and it's like, oh, wait, you know, all of these things are good things. Um, where does that come from and what's the source? So you're just, you're always looking for opportunities whether you're talking directly about Jesus and your relationship with him or not, we're constantly putting those good things in front of the players so that, you know, hopefully even years from now, you know, we may not get a, a conversion, so to speak, while we're on campus, but I know that these guys are going to go out and they're going to live life. And hopefully they will think back on the lessons that they learned while they were in our program and it'll help them. And I know that, you know, I think back on, things that, that I learned when I was in college and, and uh, remember things that my coach said to this day. So we are trying to teach them the gospel, sometimes directly, but sometimes indirectly, and, and hope that at, one, at some point with various guys in different life situations, they'll look back on it and they'll say, oh, I remember that my coach said this, and that might lead them you know, into a relationship with Christ. So I think it's, you know, it, the, the short answer to your question is we just try to live the gospel uh, in everything that we do and, and hope that that sticks. And some of the guys are already there. I mean, some of the guys are very mature um, and, you know, some aren't. So we, that's kind of our approach. It's probably something you've learned or I have to imagine saw during your playing days, right? That you would instill into your, into your time now as a coach, especially the intentionality of loving and serving like Christ, but not necessarily force feeding them the Bible every single day. Did, is that something that you saw and witnessed and ex saw as an example when you were a player as well? Oh, hundred percent. I, I feel like that um, I was able to positively impact a lot of my teammates in that indirect fashion where you just, you love them, you serve them where they're at. And um, I still have guys that will reach back out, you know, that I hadn't talked to in, in years that will say, well, you know, you, when you did this or, and even stuff that you don't even realize that makes a difference, you know, like I've had, I've had guys say, man, I really appreciated the way you treated me when I was a young player and you were a veteran and, you know, that had a big impact on me. And I was like, well, I don't remember doing anything <laughs> particularly special. It's just, you know, when you, you try to treat people with the same love and respect that you have been uh, shown by by Christ, and when you do that, even when you don't realize something good's happening, it, it might be. So uh, those type of experiences have very much impacted and influenced the way that I try to coach these guys. Which is, hey, you know, show them that you're willing to serve them. You know, show them that you're not above going out there and working on the field or taking the screen off or helping a guy with the equipment. And you know, as the head coach. Uh, you certainly have the right to to demand, hey, you pick that up and carry it, or you do this, or you do that. But I think if you're willing to put yourself in those positions of service, guys notice that. E even if they can't quite articulate it, it has a huge impact on you know what they see is is the right way to be and the right way to treat people. And and so you know down the road, like again, you hope that they think back and they're like, man, I remember when coach did this or said that, and. Uh, and then God uses that seed that was planted uh, to, to grow something special in their heart. Is it hard to believe that you've been out of this game for almost a decade as a player? Because I was lucky. <laughs> and I said, oh, my gosh, it's been almost it's been nine years since you last played. And that means I'm getting old, too, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's crazy. It, you know, you do realize how fleeting 
uh, your career is for sure. But then life in general, I mean, you look back and you're like, oh my goodness, it has, it's been, a, it's, it's just, you know, we had the 10 year reunion of our world series team last year. And I was like, my goodness, that seemed like it was maybe two or three years ago, but it's been 10 and, um, you know, you just, it goes by quick. So you have to take advantage of the time. What was that experience like going back to St. Louis? It's funny because you spent the majority of your career in Houston with the Astros, obviously being able to still be in Houston now and coaching, but you're so identified, especially in that St. Louis uh, community by that 2011 Cardinals team, which was so special and such a miraculous in many ways, victory and winning the world series. What was that like to kind of have that reunion with your teammates a year ago? Oh, it was, it was a blast. I mean, it was great to see guys and catch up. And it's, it's funny because when you've competed with, I would suspect that it's very much like, you know, serving in the military with a group of guys. Like when you, when you've had those great emotional, you know, almost traumatic type experiences that bonds you in a way that um, you could not talk to somebody for 10 years. And then the second you see them, you fall right back into the same relationship that you had with them back then it's almost like you know time stops and so being back and, and being with those guys it was a it was a great experience and everybody it, it was it was just like being back in the clubhouse I mean it was like no time had passed at all and and I think that's a really neat thing and and just greatly enjoyed that that was that was a very special team not just because we won the world series but because of the quality of human beings that were on that team and there were so many of them and you know guys enjoyed being together uh, and it was very much that way when we got back together 10 years later. And two that are still on the team. When you look at the yeah. Cardinals in 2022 and you see Wainwright and you see Molina and you're like, yeah, are these guys still doing it. Well, three now with Albert. I mean, Albert, you know, That's he true. signed back, you know, so they're still they're still plugging. Um, and it is it's incredible to think that, hey, these guys are, are still grinding it out in the big leagues. Um, but yeah, I mean, just you know, great players, I guess, you know, they, that just shows how many good players we had on that team. You got, you know, three future Hall of Famers possibly that are that are still at it. It's crazy. And it'll be fun to watch and see how that kind of plays out throughout 2022. I want to ask you this question, it might be a hard one to answer, but maybe it's not considering, you know, the role that you're in now as a coach, but we're facing a lot of distractions right now, just as people. Um, what's your encouragement maybe for those that are struggling with their faith, maybe struggling with the distractions of life, the world's coming at you from right now, it feels like every different angle coming out of a pandemic and all of what we just went through, hopefully coming out of a pandemic, by the way, I should say, but what's the encouragement that you would have for those that are just kind of wrestling right now a little bit with, with everything going on? Well, I think the the thing that is highlighted for me is that there's only one source of peace. I mean, the world is not it. And if your hope is in politics or if it's in health or if it's in, you know, finances or your social media platform, if it's in any of those things, you're always going to be disappointed because those things can't bear that weight. And so, um, you know, our hope is in Christ is, is the, the only place to find peace is in that relationship with, with God. And so um, I almost, you know, I almost try to use, we had this conversation like two days ago on the field. I told the, you know, cause you guys are, we're having a tough season and um, mm -hmm. you referenced all of the unrest and all the things that are going, going on. And I told them, I was like, guys, look, I mean, the reality is life is tough. I mean, and, and, you know, and it's also temporary. And, and you're not going to live forever. And so all these things are swirling around. There's one place that you can find constancy and peace, and that's in a relationship with Jesus. And so, um, you know, I, I, I almost, I don't want to say I'm glad because obviously nobody wants to have bad things happen in the world, but, you know, it, it's, it definitely highlights the need for something that is more secure, that is more constant, that is, you know, more trustworthy than, you know, than the things that you can get from the world. And, and if, if you're alive today, you certainly have felt some of that, even as a believer. I mean, that's the challenge of applying your faith. You, you, you feel like things are kind of falling apart at the seams, but you know that God is still in control and, and there's great peace that comes from that. So, um, 
that's my encouragement to these guys is like, Hey man, look around you. And if you're, if you're depending on some of these things for happiness and peace, you're, you know, you're not going to find it. And it, and it kind of drives people to the cross. So, uh, in that way, I think it's good. So as we release this interview, father's day is just a little bit away, uh, a couple of days here. I'm curious for you as the dad to four girls, what this day means to you and what it means to be a dad. Well, I think the first thing I think about when I think about being a dad is just the tremendous responsibility that you have to love and care for your children and to raise them in a way that gives them a great chance to be successful in life. And just like we talked about previously, I mean, there's there's nothing that will give them that foundation outside of that relationship with with Jesus. And and so we my wife and I both, you know, we, we've tried to raise our kids to, to know that, Hey, look, I mean, this is the key to life, the secret to peace, the secret to joy, the secret to the things that, um, that, that it takes to, to live a successful life. They're all found in the gospel. And so, um, I think it's a, it's a very heavy responsibility to make sure that you're doing, uh, your part to instill gospel that's to instill the gospel in your kids. And, um, we don't want, I don't want to do it just like I don't do it with my players or with the, with my former teammates. I don't want to do that in an overbearing way. I want my children to have an authentic faith that's their own. And so I look at my role as a father, as one, not of a, an authoritarian, you know, dictator, but more of a shepherd and that, you know, we're trying to shepherd our children's hearts in the direction of the gospel. And we trust that God is going to do the, the work ultimately in their hearts. And so, um, you know, parenting is, <laughs> if you have it figured out by the time you get it figured out, you know, you're, the kids are out of the house. And so, uh, that's why I think there's a lot of, of people that make better grandparents than they do parents because they have the experience um, and, and mistakes are going to be made. And that's where you just have to trust that, that the Lord has got them and that he's going to to do with them what he wills. And and so um, but when I think about my role as a father, you know, I think about those kinds of things, being an example um, you know, letting them see you make mistakes, you know, not be, being authentic and being honest. And, um, you know, my kids know that I'm not perfect and, but they, but they can see, you know, how you handle failure, how you, you know, handle success. I mean, so being able to demonstrate those things and being aware that they're watching and knowing that, that, Hey, this is on you. I mean, you're the leader of the house. You're, you know, uh, you have a great responsibility to shepherd these children. And so uh, when I think about fatherhood, all those things kind of, you know, come into my mind. I also think of four girls uh, and just how that's four times, maybe three kids each. You might have like a dozen grandchildren before it's said and done, Lance. Have you thought about that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that would be awesome because, uh, you know, if I, I, it's crazy how you can, how much you can love four different people um, the same, you know, I think about each one of my girls and, you know, they're, they're all different, but I love them all just the same. And to think that, oh, well, you know, you start having these grandchildren, you know, there's a dozen or more of them running around and how each one is going to be uniquely created with, with different gifts and abilities and challenges. And so, you know, and how you kind of, um, navigate all those things. It's, it's an exciting, fun thing to think about. And, and for sure, you know, who knows what, God will have, but uh, we've certainly set ourselves up to have the possibility of of, uh, of a couple of baseball teams anyway. And with our grandkids, you know, we might have <laughs> we might have a couple of teams that we could scrimmage uh, one of these days. So, well, I told my daughter she's 18 uh, and just graduating high school soon, like within a few days here. And you know, she's going to go off to college and hopefully, you know, have a great time there and come back and hopefully continue to have her journey with God. But I did say to her, listen, uh, I, I need a grandson here. And she's like, dad, <laughs> this is way too early for this. I said, I understand yeah. this stuff is going to come quicker. I just want to plant a seed now mm -hmm. that Jason, your dad here needs, needs a grandson. I, have you kind of planted that? It's not, no, I wouldn't say planted that seed. Listen, we love our girls. Right. But it'd be nice to have a little grandson walking around and be able to, to be a papa too. Oh, a hundred percent. You know, it, it's, uh, 
the girls, the girls, as you know, are special. I mean, I, I wouldn't trade um, one of my daughters for, for any stinky old boy, but by the same, <laughs> by the same token, you know, it would be, it would be, uh, I think very, a special experience. I think about my relationship with my grandfathers, you know, and, and just how cool that is. And so to, to be able to do the same kind of things with a grandson that you, that I was able to do with my grandfathers, that would be, that would be really special too. It would be pretty cool. Lance, uh, last question. I've asked you this before when you were on the show a couple of years ago, but I'll ask it to you again. Uh, what's God teaching you today? What's he showing you? What are you learning from him today in the season of life that you're in? We've talked a lot about different lessons and about some of the things that God has brought you to, but what's he teaching you directly in the life that you're living right now? I think the biggest thing is just how to receive and extend grace. And, I, and so I think, you know, growing up in my background is in the Church of Christ, which is just to the right of Baptist. I mean, it's as conservative as it gets. And, you know, and at times it can be um, the, the emphasis could be more on the truth of God rather than the love of God. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, learning how to balance that and, and what, what ends up happening is you you, you don't allow yourself to receive God's grace. And if you're not allowing yourself to receive the grace of God, it's hard to extend it to other people. And so, you know, they're without getting into a huge, you know, psychoanalysis of my personality. But when you when you've grown up in a in a in a profession that demands performance and you're rewarded for, for, for performance and you're essentially punished for lack of performance yeah. and to also have that. Uh, as your spiritual background, it can lead you to treat other people that way, where you're looking at them as, hey, you're either all plus or you're all minus, you know, you either got it done or you failed. And people are more complex than that. They're more nuanced than that. And I think one of the, the big thing that God's taught me over the last 12 months is, number one, I have to be willing to receive God's grace. And I have to be, you know, almost, and not in a this is going to sound, you know, maybe not right or new agey or something, but you have to learn to love yourself in terms of like, you know, I, I can love myself because God loves me. And because that, yeah. you know, because I've been forgiven and because I can receive the grace of God, I can be okay with who I am. And then what that frees you up to do that I've learned is you can extend that grace to other people. And so, you know, my expectations of other people are now governed more by grace than they've ever been. And so, you know, especially as I'm dealing with these players, they have challenges out the wazoo. I mean, it seems like on a daily basis, we're dealing with something that happened to this guy or that guy did this or said that, and you're, you're managing those things. And I feel like before I was, I would come at that more from a place of, you know, judgment, retribution, punishment. And now I'm able to season that because I think the truth of God is critically important. You can, you can be too much the other direction where, Oh, it's all love and rainbows and this and that yeah. God's truth is on as is, unchangeable it's unchanging so you can't ever lose that but you can temper it with the grace and love and so I think that's where I've done the most growing uh, as a coach as a father as a husband and really even for myself personally where I've learned to season everything with the grace of God and without you know without compromising the truth of God well, that was Jesus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When you yeah. read the Gospels, he was he was fully truth and fully fully grace. When you think mm. about the way that he treated others, he never compromised, you know, the truth of of his Father, and he certainly uh, treated everyone with the grace and dignity that, um, you know, that I guess only he could do. So, yeah, it's it's basically being Christ like and that ambassador for Jesus, like you mentioned. That's right. But, Lance, uh, thanks for being here, buddy. Thanks for being on the show. Uh, thanks for coming back. I hope to get to see you in person uh, later this year. And uh, all the best to you at Houston Baptist. And thanks for joining us, buddy. Thanks, Jason. Always great to visit with you.